Hello, hello, and welcome to the nation. You're watching, uh, uh, you're with me, Elaine Nobla, and watching Bram News Channel BNC, where it's all about you. Uh, today, we're speaking about a very special topic. We are speaking about new trademark act and its impact on business. This is in light of the recent passing by the day one riot of the trademarks bill 2019, and Malaysia, of course, is in the process of process of acceding to the Madrid Protocol relating to the Madrid Agreement concerning the international registration of marks adopted in Madrid on the 27th of June 1989. This is to take advantage of the 21st century mega trademark development impacting global business and online entrepreneurship. And of course, in the studio, I have a very special guest. I have here Gita Kandia. She is, uh, of course, a lawyer as well, as well as an IP expert. As we explore what these uh, changes uh, in the trademark bill will affect businesses. Hello and welcome, Gita. Welcome aboard. Hi, Elaine. Let's talk about this trademarks bill 2019 that was recently passed on the 20, uh, 2nd of July. Uh, I think it was first uh, tabled in Parliament back in April. Um, I think um, this may not have caught on a lot of attention of people because not a lot of people know what the changes, how it's going to affect them, how it's going to affect business. So from your point of view, what's the first thing that uh, is the, the most key uh, difference or the key change that will happen with this passing of trademarks bill? Um, so the main changes uh, is actually the new act. Mm -hmm. They replaced the old act with a new act. They didn't just amend the act. And the main change is that the act now kind of adapts to what businesses need. Okay, at this point in time. So compared to before, uh, was it um, was it less flexible prior to this or was it uh, not covering a lot of things prior to this? So, so great question. Uh, the law always tries to catch up with what business needs. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the old act, was relevant in those days, decades ago it was relevant. But as businesses grow and it becomes borderless, a lot of businesses are not just looking in their national jurisdiction yes, when they're looking at um, expanding, then the need of the act was uh, an utmost necessary. So one of the main changes is that local businesses can protect their brands globally in an efficient and cost-effective manner. That's right. Now, I understand that uh, our act was actually taken from a UK act, which was way, way, way back in 1938 that was uh, it was drafted based on that act. Now, the new act needs to be recreated instead of, like you said, amendments. Isn't that like a huge task that, or a huge undertaking? Yes, it was. They had to look at all the provisions, what was missing from the provisions, what, where was it lacking in terms of the act protects two parties, the act protects, protects brand owners because they work really hard to build equity in their brand mm -hmm. over time. And so they need to make sure that when brand owners are building their brand, their brands are protected in the best way possible. Mm -hmm. And the act also protects people. You and me, we are the lay people who, when we go to the supermarket, we need to be not confused with similar brands in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So it protects two people, two parties, the brand owners and the lay people. So the act took into consideration how do we then what adjustments do we need to make to make sure these two parties are well protected and uh, moving with times in terms of globally in the business era? Is this why it took a little bit of time? Because this, I mean, a lot of parties say that this is long overdue, you know, back in 2013. It was meant to be in line with the, the ASEAN business uh, community. There's, there's an ASEAN plan of 2011 to 2015, which was when this was supposed to be, I think, in tandem with. So uh, we're now in 2019, just only coming like four years after, sorry, six years after. Um, and is that why it's taking this long? Uh, it probably took a few reasons. Uh, so uh, intellectual property rights are governed by the Malaysian Intellectual Property Office, mm -hmm. which uh, that's where all the registrations are done. Yep. Uh, the office needs to be ready to embrace the changes as well. Right. So when we talk about one of the main changes is that a lot of local businesses can protect their brands globally. Mm. Uh, that is done through the IP office. So mm. they need to have examiners in place, systems in place, right. softwares in place, and examiners need to be trained as well with this new uh, uh, international registration system. So they probably needed more time mm. uh, to ensure that, yes, we can introduce the act, but is the systems in place and yes. the procedures in place to execute the changes? Is it already now then supposed yes. to be in place? So so the act's not enforced yet. That's yeah. the other thing, because the regulations to support the act is not out. Yeah. Uh, but it's all heading in that direction. Regulations will be out soon, and then everything will be executed. But yes, so the intellectual property office has been trained by the World Intellectual Property Organization 
Mm -hmm. So that's probably some of the reasons that uh, it took this long. Right. So this means that uh, going taking a brand global will be made much easier. Uh, we are one of the last few in the ASEAN region to actually accede to the Madrid Protocol. Uh, I think there are only two others uh, within ASEAN that uh, have did not or have not acceded prior to this, which is Malaysia and another country. The rest have already uh, jumped on the bandwagon quite early on. Um, so tell us, how, how is this going to make, uh, why will this make it easier for us to be able to take the brands globally? So the main thing is that when businesses go abroad, their brands are then built overseas. Goodwill and reputation is built overseas. Mm -hmm. How do they protect it? Mm -hmm. Currently, under the old act, yeah. uh, they had to do it individually when you file in Thailand you have to actually file one application in Thailand or in Indonesia or in Singapore so in each individual country correct so which right. then means you appoint a uh, intellectual property lawyer in that specific country yeah. so you incur cost of uh, hiring a lawyer yeah. and you're also communicating with various parties yeah. so it's not an efficient way moving forward so with Madrid protocol what it means is an international registration system is introduced mm. one thing to understand it's not an international registration so it's not one registration that covers all the countries in the world right it's a system so it's a system where um, it's a procedure where you when you file it in Malaysia Malaysia sends these documents to Geneva where the World Intellectual Property is, or Office is mm -hmm. and they then uh, disseminate the documents so it's then sent to different different countries where protection is sought mm -hmm. uh, which means that it's IP office to an IP office right. you don't have the lawyers in between right. assisting you to register the trademark right that whole process which is now systemized makes it easier there's only one filing one set of documents uh, one person you're communicating with so all of that eliminates time uh, makes it a lot more cost-effective and it's easier hassle-free for a brand owner a so, business owner. so what that means is when you file here in Malaysia it doesn't mean that you automatically you automatically get coverage to all the 104 countries that the Madrid protocol covers mm -hmm. but you are able to select all 104 countries if you choose to have That's that right. but you can also select say for example I just want to plan for five or ten or fifteen yes. or twenty w however large or small that you want to have yeah. your that's right IP. I mean you got it spot on so right. your, un your understanding of it is excellent the the other added beauty of the Madrid protocol is that you can choose five countries now let's say you have a business mm. and I'm in five countries now but I do not know whether my business will be successful do I need to then protect it in EU or US where I'm not venturing to now mm -hmm. uh, the beauty of it is that you don't have to decide now mm. you can decide later and you can designate later right okay. through the system as well right but that that means that if somebody steps ahead and registers something similar there in that country, you might have lost that opportunity. That's right. <laughs> Pros and cons to when you decide. The strategy involved is so important because I say uh, I said earlier it's cost effective. Yeah. Uh, that it is cost effective uh, comes with a pinch of salt <laughs> because if you're choosing a few countries yeah. and if it's a Southeast Asian countries, then yeah. going direct ironically is cheaper than right. using the Madrid protocol right but if you're choosing many countries and some of the countries are uh, cu the currency can be overbearing on the local business yeah uh, then choosing the Madrid protocol is better right okay so uh, you I, I think uh, quite some time back we've also talked about trademarks and how to manage it and you know there's timelines to it I understand that this new bill also shortens certain timelines perhaps you can share a little bit uh, about that Yes, yeah, so the, previously any registration in Malaysia, there isn't a requirement that examination needs to be done within 18 months. Mm -hmm. uh, with, and then again, that is why probably the Act took a while to um, uh, get in place. So the Intellectual Property Office has to examine all trademark applications that come through the Madrid Protocol application within 18 months. Right. That timeline uh, restricts or speeds up a lot of things in the IP office and that requires enough manpower as well right so that means that you would be guaranteed almost within a certain time frame to be able to settle whatever applications that you have put in to the trademark office that's right okay so now let's move on to businesses I understand that with this introduction as well uh, what is uh, trademarkable, I don't know whether that's a word, uh, has also expanded uh, or has changed in terms of definition a little bit. Uh, hence, uh, there's a, the, 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 the idea of the suggestion of having to revisit what is 
considered their unique setting point of the USP. Right. So the, this is the second change that the Act brings forward. Um, the, traditionally, we have marks that are visually appealing. Yeah, whether it's name, whether it's a, a, logo. It's a logo. Oh, it's a tagline. Yes. So you have Air Asia, now everyone can fly. You have Maxis, you think of a telco company. Yeah. You have Barbas, and you think of spices and curry powder. Yeah. So that's the traditional way of running a business. You look at the brand, the logo, and it, the source of indication of who's behind that brand uh, is related to the visually. Mm. Uh, and now it's an experience economy. Mm. Experience economy means everyone wants, wants to experience something, experience the brand. Mm. So business owners have gone beyond just it being visual. They touch on other senses. Mm -hmm. It could be the shape of the product, it could be the smell and um, the color. So the fact that when we now experience the whole process and I look at a shape, uh, and I'm, that's this example here. Yeah. So you look at this fizzy drink, yeah. and you, without looking at a brand, you don't know what brand this is, mm -hmm. but yet you know which company produces it. Yeah. So the fact that the shape has indicated who's behind this product means that that shape is proving to be a trademark. Right. So now shapes can be registered as a trademark. In the past, it was not. It was so only logos, word marks, and device, which is um, right. uh, which is logos, uh, images. So does it? Does this now mean that businesses need to go back to the trademark office to get these kind of things uh, filed? Uh, the shapes, so, so the sound, the smell, the taste. So the first thing, <laughs> I very, don't know. very good question. So the first thing they have to do is revisit their unique selling points in their own business. Mm. Do they have shapes of products that really denote their own product? Are people recognizing it and thinking of them? So the color purple for chocolates, mm. well, what comes to mind? Cadbury. So th that has to take time to build up. Mm. It doesn't happen overnight. If I'm a new chocolate manufacturer mm. and I want to protect the color orange for my chocolates, mm. you, I can't protect it because people do not recognize that as my brand yet. Right. So it, that takes time to build. Uh, and okay, so other example for shapes for business owners to be aware of uh, the shape, a triangular chocolate, what brand comes to mind? Uh, Toblerone. So the fact that all of this ends up being a brand shows that the businesses need to be aware that it's not just a word that could represent your brand. Mm. It could be other elements to that. Mm. And then they need to see, can that be protected and how do they go about it? So if I right now, because I assume that with this introduction, none of this is currently protected, whether it's the shape or the scent, and I go to the trademark office and trademark the triangle shape for my chocolate, does that then prevent Tomorrow from doing so here? Such interesting questions <laughs> you have. You're like trying to predict the questions that other business... Uh, uh, it is... Uh, so there's a whole other ball game because well-known brands have better protection. Yeah. So these well-known brands that I'm talking about are so well-known. It would be difficult for a local business owner to register the shape of this shape for fizzy drinks right. and the shape of Toblerone, the triangular right. shape for chocolate. So if anybody wanted to sort of monetize this current trademark, they might have to, you know, be a little bit more creative than it, that. It is true, <laughs> it is true. And and the other thing about, it's called non-traditional trademarks. Right. It's uh, trademarks that are not traditional. Right. These non-traditional trademarks are very difficult to secure, secure protection. Right. So it's a higher level threshold of examination that they have to pass. Right. We will take a short breather right now. When we come back, we will talk a little bit more about uh, the ease or maybe uh, what are the additional things that the trademark has allowed, whether it's the multi-class uh, trademark applications and how the protection scope is now a little bit wider. Stay tuned for that and more. We will be right back. Nang 11 menampilkan pelbagai segmen menarik khas buat anda. Saksikan Nang 11 setiap Isnin hingga Jumaat 9 pagi. Hanya di Bernama News Channel.
Hai, nama saya Johar bin Ahmad Syarifuddin. Penglibatan kami dalam penjualan di dalam media sosial seperti Facebook, Twitter, Instagram adalah setahun yang lepas. Keberkesanan internet dalam jualan adalah dari segi peningkatan jualan dan dari segi skop pemasaran semakin besar. Termasuk kita dapat customer luar daripada Malaysia seperti Singapura, China dan Filipin. Di media sosial, dia ada banyak aspek yang mana boleh membantu dalam pendekatan jualan. Kerana media sosial yang yang ada sekarang, semuanya percuma. Gunakan uh, platform media sosial untuk memasarkan produk-produk dengan lebih meluas. Tak salah, kita cuba. Welcome back on The Nation. You're still with me, Elaine Abla, and uh, you're watching Bram News Channel, where it's all about you. Today, we're talking about trademarks, trademarks, trademarks. Recently, they went right past the Trademarks Bill 2019, and we have the question of, with this new Trademark Act, uh, what is its impact on businesses? And in the studio, we're speaking to Gita Kandia. She's an IP expert. Gita, we went through quite a few, you know, uh, potential things that might have cropped up in people's minds with regards to this new trademark. Mark Act, it may be ways to make a quick and fast buck. <laughs> uh, but let's not talk about multi-class trademark applications. Apparently, this is now possible. Uh, at the same time, you know, there were quite a number of things that have uh, saved time and saved costs uh, with the ability to go global. What is multi-class trademark application? So trademark applications are filed in 45 categories, mm. 34 for goods and 11 for services. Mm. That means that if someone runs a business, they can't protect their trademark, ABC trademark, for everything under the sun. Mm. They actually have to specify what business are they doing, mm. what specific products are they selling, or what services are they producing, okay. um, so, uh, providing under that brand. So previously, when you have one trademark and you use it on a multitude of products, mm. you will have to register that many classes if, right. it, if it falls in different classes. For example? Okay, so let's look at a restaurant. Mm. Uh, if Give me, okay, Madam Kwan's, for example. Mm. If they have a restaurant, that's a service, mm. a service of providing food and beverage. Mm. In the restaurant, let's say they sell food products, mm. spices, or sauces to some of their amazing right, dishes. Right. That's like a retail sales. Yes, correct. And that's products, food products. Yeah. So, but it's retail sales in their own, either in their own restaurant yeah. or even in grocery shops. Right. They might venture to that, start right. selling Madam Kwan sauces. Correct. And they also sell franchises. Mm. So there's franchises blooming around Malaysia or in other countries. Uh, but we're looking at protection in Malaysia. So that already, already has a few classes. You're right. looking at class 43. Now I'm going a bit technical, yeah. I know. But class 43 is for food and beverage services. Mm. <coughs> class 30 is for food products. Right. And class 35 is for franchising. So just because you registered your trademark doesn't mean that within that class, say for example, I, I sell a bottle of water, uh, but if I sell that as a drink in a restaurant, it doesn't necessarily cover if you did not register it. So ideal protection would be to register in all the classes that you are already providing those goods and services. Right. The reason I have to explain that is uh, that's the best protection because if a new breach uh, trademark, it's called trademark infringement. Uh, the fastest way to get, take an action against someone is if you have a certificate of registration for that specific goods or services. That's the fastest way. So, with this new bill, what has changed? Uh, so, okay, we, back to the classes. Uh, previously, companies will get protection in the various classes anyway, mm. but now it's cheaper because there's this thing called multi class application. So, one application to the IP office, you can immediately choose a few classes. Right, so you can and tick, tick, tick those boxes. Correct. So right. like similar to the international application. Right. Now, you don't have to do three separate applications incurring right. costs three times. Right. So that makes it a lot cheaper for the business owner. So that makes sense. Now, I understand that under this new uh, trademarks bill as well, there's a wider scope of protection. How is that so? So earlier, uh, I was saying that if you got a certificate of registration, it will be, I have this mark for this specific goods. Okay, let's say again, um, Mary Brown has this trademark for food and beverages, mm. which is class 43. Mm. Um, previously, under the old act, for trademark infringement to be found in court, uh, there needs to be a use of the identical mark on identical services. Ah. So the infringer would need to have an identical mark under identical services. Mm. The wider scope of protection now afforded by the new act gives that the identical mark, if used on related goods and services, 
the the owner of that brand can still sue for trademark infringement. So you can take action. In the past, this is not covered. Yeah, so you can take action for matters that might not be your core business. Mm. But hey, wait a minute. People are still being confused because mm. I run a food and beverage industry. I have a restaurant, mm. but you're now selling food products mm. with my brand on it. Mm. So it gives a wider scope of protection, and brand owners now have stronger ammo mm. in court against misusers. Right, that's good. Now, at least uh, I think a lot of people who put money into the trademarks, into creating a brand, now feel a little bit more protected and, and their ability to uh, take action against those who infringe. I think that's one of the things in terms of monitoring, uh, in terms of enforcement is in terms of being uh, able to after you've gone through all the trouble to actually take action to protect it yeah that's right I mean it's disheartening to yes. protect a brand and not be able to attack and actually utilize this registration and these rights if you've gone all the way to even get it registered <laughs> exactly now let's talk about false representation as a registered trademark uh, you will get fined did you not get fined before <laughs> <laughs> so interesting aspects of the changes, yeah? yeah. Uh, before it was still unlawful to have the symbol R with a circle around it mm -hmm. on your trademark if you have not registered it. Ah, it's still unlawful. So okay. um, the thing, the only difference here is it's unlawful, yes, but how does it deter misusers or people who are wrongfully representing to the public if they are not aware, if they're not aware of where or of the fine or what's the consequences so the fact that if it's not they're not aware of the consequences they might still continue to misuse or go against the law so i cannot use that word r uh, with that circle around it on something like for example i put my name <laughs> elaine and i put r because i'm the only one that has it for example and your brand so uh, yes, yeah you should <laughs> so uh, it's unlawful if i don't register it i it, cannot put it yes it's Ooh. unlawful <laughs> and now there's a risk of you being fined for ten thousand ringgit <laughs> Okay, I didn't know that. So that but it's not unlawful for business owners to use the symbol TM. TM. Okay, yeah. so you can use TM uh, after something that has been trademarked. So how no, would so you... So you can use TM on your brand, Elaine, mm -hmm. uh, if you wish to show the public that's my brand. Okay. Even if you do not have a trademark application. Right, okay. Mm. But if you have a trademark application and only when it's approved... Only when it's registered. Registered. You can use the R with the circle around it. Okay, so that one takes... Of course, that whole gambit, gambit of all the things that you need to do, your application, whatever, before you can put R. So uh, if, I, if I'm a trademark officer right now, I can go around and go and look at whoever that's put R's and start fining you 10000 if you've not registered for I think they have, they have more things on their plate with the Madrid protocol coming. <laughs> the trademark examiners. <laughs> Okay. We'll, have, we'll be busy anyway. <laughs> right. Uh, so uh, I think I, I just want to talk in summary. What are the things that businesses uh, in the last few minutes uh, should be looking at with regards to this new trademark? If, if there's top of the list, if there's a lot of things to do, what are the first few things that they should focus on? So it would be the main two. Uh, the first one is looking at their own unique selling points uh, because that might result in them realizing that something that they've been using for many years that represents their company uh, as a source of indicator might be registrable as a non-traditional trademark right be it so they might be at risk they might I mean they, they won't be at risk but if you can get a registration for it that's great mm. so for example this uh, if protected as a design mm. the protection is only for 25 years right but as a trademark it's pre pretty much protection for life right. every 10 years you protect it so that's very important okay second thing that business owners need to look at at global protection what they might be currently be pursuing individual registrations in different country mm. well that can be looked at and strategized to get a more cost cost effective way of getting protection abroad okay um, that's uh, in, in, in wrapping I under I read somewhere that um, if you have uh, submitted something for examination prior to the new bill is still applicable under the previous law and not under the new law is that correct the transition province prov provisions are quite hefty uh, it depends uh, in terms of examination process everything will still continue according to the old all act okay all right thank you so much uh, Gita for that overview uh, and if you have of course a brand that is uh, uh, very important uh, very special and it's trademarked it's time you relook at what needs to be done with the passing of the new trademarks bill 20 19. That's all the time that we have on the nation. Uh, uh, thanks for staying with us till the end of the show. Bye for now. Thank you. Welcome.